we have a real kind of almost meritocratic conception of lifting that it's like either you were born a football linebacker and you lift weights or you're everybody else and you don't bother with weights because there's no reason for you to be strong, which like nothing could be less true. Everyone could benefit from like learning to squat or deadlift 135 pounds. You're like, I swear to God, your life would be completely different. It would feel different every single day if you just learned to do this. And I think we could benefit from that information sort of percolating a lot more. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Well, this is a fun one today, something a little different. I'm going to tell you a story first, and then we're going to talk to our guests. So the story is that in the fall of 2017, we had got a house upstate, which I mentioned before, that's where we were during part of the pandemic, and uh, we got one of those, you know those benches that like upholstered benches you put at the end of a bed, but then you could, like store linen in them or whatever? So we had gotten one of those, and I went over to pick it up, thinking that it, did not realizing it opened and you could put things in it. So I went up over and it was like cheap, like overstock.com thing. It was not an expensive piece of furniture. I went over to grab it thinking it was like 25 pounds, but it had been loaded with stuff. So it was like 125 pounds. And in grabbing down to reach it, I like pulled out my back in a really gnarly way. Like one of those like, oh, in the moment you realize this is something bad has happened. (laughs) That's probably going to stay with me for a while. So like I had to walk around. I couldn't like sit. I had to lay down. I spent a few days recovering. And then, you know, it got slowly better, but then it just persisted and it persisted enough and was, and was painful and and enough that I started going to a physical therapist, went for some stuff on strengthening my core. And then she was like, oh, you should maybe work out with a personal trainer. That's the really the best way to restore yourself and to heal this injury is to just get stronger, to get your core stronger. And that's going to take pressure off your back and to strengthen all these different muscles around where you injured yourself and your glutes and your IT bands, which are these muscles that are sort of on the outside of your hips. And like all of that stuff getting stronger is going to help you heal and help prevent you from getting injured again. Now, over the course of my life, I have gone through periods. I I always played pickup basketball. I've always loved sports and I love basketball in particularly. And I've gone through different periods of working out in a gym or not working out in a gym. But I started seeing this trainer. His name is Eric Freeman. I love and adore him, as you'll see in our today's conversation. And in the beginning, all we were doing was a lot of like core work, a lot of like planking, things called bear crawls, where you sort of crawl on the ground like a bear and all this stuff that I could feel making parts of my body stronger that hadn't been strong and also effectuating this healing of the back muscle and and taking away the back pain. And it was really pretty miraculous and it felt really good to get stronger. And then at a certain point, we started to transition from a lot of what we call body work, like planking and that kind of stuff, to weights. And then we started lifting weights. And for the first time in my life, probably since I was like in high school, I started lifting weights seriously with like a serious program on a serious schedule that was repeated day after day and week after week and doing free weights and doing some of the major basic lifts, deadlifts, squats, bench press, three main ones that I do. And I started getting a lot stronger (laughs) and it was really fun. And I discovered that I love this thing. I like being under several hundred pounds of weight on a squat where it feels like the world will end if you lose concentration for a second and everything in your mind goes blank. And I got really into it and I'm still doing it today. And then I started to get into like, I started to sort of get into it as a hobby. I mean, I started reading more about free weights and about lifting technique. And I started my social media feeds because the algorithm knows who you are, starts picking up on it. And the funny thing is, there's an enormous world out there around us, as one might imagine, like TikToks and Instagram and influencers and YouTube. And like, a lot of it is like really reactionary garbage. (laughs) Like It's just, and it's sort of a bummer because there is something to me really pure and beautiful about this thing that I've discovered about getting stronger and about working out. But every time that I like go into a cultural space to try to enjoy it, I end up bumping up against like Neanderthal nonsense and like anti-vaxxers. And like, I want there to be a sort of, I don't know, like progressive left space of workout meatheads that doesn't exist really. But the closest thing I've I've found um, is the writer uh, who is our guest today. Her name is Casey Johnson. 
And she wrote this column that I, I started reading, which is very funny, called Ask a Swole Woman. And that has now moved over to her Substack, uh, which is called She's a Beast, which I read on Substack. And she's like a cultural critic and a writer and editor. She lifts heavyweights, and she's been writing about fitness for over a decade. She was the editorial director of health and lifestyle coverage of Vice, but she's like one of the few people I've found who is like fusing a genuine sort of like pure love of and enthusiasm for weightlifting and fitness, not as like a gross culturally overdetermined activity, but actually a sort of like restorative one physically and mentally and spiritually with like incisive cultural commentary and criticism of how weird the world around all that stuff is. And so I've been wanting to talk to her for a long time, both about that, but also about like, you know, getting swole and how we stay swole. (laughs) And so uh, Casey, it's great to have you on the podcast. Wow. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. What a lovely introduction. I'm going to steal this for when I talk about myself. Would you agree with that premise there that like, if you're like, oh, I want to watch stuff about squats on YouTube, it's like, you're like two jumps from QAnon half the time. Yeah. Like, it's it's a little weird how much the algorithm or the world seem to sort of push you in that direction if you start getting into stuff around, like, lifting heavy weights, for instance. Yes, I think you're not wrong. And I also find this very mystifying. I'm not sure why but we have this real kind of very narrowly circumscribed, like acceptable forms of exercise for people who like are intellectual. It's like, you can run, you can do Pilates, you can use your Peloton. If you lift weights, you're like automatically a Cro-Magnon kind of person. And I'm not sure why that sort of divide persists even now. Like, I think we've learned a lot about lifting, especially in the last like 10 or so years, but still I have trouble sort of bringing people over to the side and I'm not really sure why. Well, I think that's part of the reason, right? Because I think the culture around it tends to be a little weirdly alienating and intimidating and not particularly welcoming. So like there is a little bit of meatheadiness around it. And if you ever go to a gym and like you're in the room with the free weights, that's often not the most inviting place. And to be honest, I think that if I didn't have a trainer, I probably wouldn't have started doing this stuff because it feels intimidating or scary or not like a welcoming space for a newbie. (laughs) For sure. But it's like, but then it's like a little bit of a a chicken and egg problem where it's like people who don't go in are the people who are not there. And then it's like, but it's also like, I'm there. I don't know. I think we might be, we might be judging people a little bit too much on who they are before we go into the weight rooms. I do agree though, that the people making content online, they are like often very, there's a lot of problematic conservatives out there who are like very big figures in the space. But then a lot of many people I know are just like kind of holding their nose as they recommend this like beginner strength program or whatever, because they're like, oh boy, this guy's like a bit of a Nazi apologist, but his program's really good. And it's just rough. (laughs) Yeah. And I will say that like some of those people, I don't even like, I like, I weirdly kind of like some of them have terrible politics and I like them where I find them sort of smart and charismatic about these things. And then as soon as they deviate over. So I don't want to like foreclose it all and just be like, I will never, I will never take tips on like my bench progression from like a person who's, you know, political views don't sync up with mine. But yeah, I think there's just a little bit of a, like a a cycle that sort of happens. And I'm curious, maybe just a good place to start is like, tell me about yourself and how you first start getting into weightlifting and fitness as an enterprise that you found like satisfying. Sure. So, um, I was a pretty active kid when I got to college. I didn't really have a framework for exercise but I gained the freshman 15 and I felt really bad about myself. So I was like, I'll start trying to lose weight and like, I'll do the 1200 calorie diet and I'll get into running. And so then for the next seven years, I was just dieting sort of as aggressively as I could and running more and more and more to the point that I ran, I think four half marathons. And I was just like, I'm never getting to a point where I feel like I can stop worrying about this. If anything, I'm worrying about it more. The more that I run and the more that I diet. Oh, that's the best. That's a, such a great, it's such a great cycle. Just like when you get that nice little sort of dysmorphia mm-hmm. thing going mm-hmm. where it's like you're working more on it, but then it's just now you're noticing imperfections more. So then you got to work more. It's good. Yep. It's good. And the less you eat, the more fixated you are on eating. And it's just, it's a horrible 
drain circling thing that I don't think I, I wasn't educated very well on it. I don't know. But I also didn't feel like I was having a wildly different experience from most other women I knew where it was just like, LOL, we diet all the time. That's like what we do. <laughs> and <laughs> so I eventually I stumbled on this Reddit post that was one woman describing her experience with six months of weightlifting. And she had before and after pictures. She like described her program where she was going three days a week and she was only doing three different movements for like five reps. And the weights she was lifting had gone up by a lot and she was really enjoying it. She was like, I'm eating a lot of food and I'm loving this. And a lot of, a lot of people commented, were like, you look great and whatever. And she was like, thanks, but you know, it's not really about how I look. I'm, I'm like, I'm just excited to like do this. I was like, this is... Hear me when I say I'm actually enjoying this. (laughs) Yes, right, exactly. (laughs) That's like not entirely gaze directed. So the way she was describing it was a night and day difference from the way that I understood lifting weights, which was that you do, uh, you use every machine available in the gym. You do three sets of 20 reps on everything. So that was a night and day difference from the way I understood lifting weights, which was more of the vibe of you go to a gym and you use every single weight machine and you do three sets of 20 reps, but also that the point of lifting weights was to make you bulkier. And I was like, I never, I don't want to be bigger. I only want to be smaller. So lifting weights feels like counterintuitive to everything that I've ever known. But this woman's photos showed that it actually didn't make much of a difference at all. She looked a little more quote unquote toned as people might say, but she was not like suddenly really huge. And she was eating probably 50% more food than I was eating at that time. And I was just like, I have this all wrong. She's working out way less than I am. She's eating way more. She's getting everything that I want and working way less for it. I was like, I'm doing this all wrong. So I was like, I'll give this weightlifting thing a try. I started with reading this book called Starting Strengths by Mark Ripito, which is like a very core text to lifting, even though Mark Ripito is a bit of a controversial figure. This is like, for people that don't know this, starting strength is sort of like the foundational text in the space of like modern lifting, like contemporary lifting. And it's a sort of fascinating text. The first line is like, strength is the most important human attribute, I think is the first sentence, something like that. (laughs) Interesting. That basically like, like nothing, it's got a great first sentence, which is just basically like, there's nothing more important than being strong. To a human being. Yeah, the thing that I really liked about it was he did have this kind of like philosophical, like your body is made of systems of muscles approach where I was like, oh, I only know muscles as like, you know, you sit on the quad extension machine and you work your quads and you go to the calf raise machine and you work your calves. I never really thought about it as like, oh, your whole leg or like your whole posterior (laughs) chain is like designed to work together. That's like, how bodies are. This was, see, this was the discovery that I had in the process of the physical therapy and training was like that feeling of like, oh, wait a second, just getting stronger in these things. Again, what I used to think of like, are my biceps big? Like you think of it in terms of these vanity questions, but I was doing all this like core stuff for all these things and muscles that don't show anywhere, but it was improving the functioning of my body because a body is made up of a bunch of systems, including muscles, that are designed to like move you through the world first and foremost. Right. As opposed to like pose in front of the mirror. They're not meant to move weights on a glided track right. one at a time. And when you walk or when you pick stuff up or when you push things around, you're not doing it with like your bicep, then your tricep, then your delt, then your lat. You're doing, it's like all one fluid thing. And that was like how this beginner program was designed. It was all based around compound movements And because of that reason, it was like way fewer reps than I was used to. It was way shorter, but also like you got strong really, really fast without having to do very much. And it was shocking to me. And I, my mind was blown. This is why I started writing about it. I was like, why does nobody know about this? Why aren't more people doing, why haven't I heard about this before? Why am I hearing about it from Reddit? It was like, I had a million questions. How old were you at this point? This was when, uh, it was like seven years ago. So I was, 26, 27. Okay. And and so you start doing this and what what happens? Just what's your physical experience of it? I started doing it and I mean, not much changes right away, which was kind of very surprising to me, but the initial feelings that you get are like the type of hunger that you feel for food when you start lifting is very different from when you do cardio. It's like a very 
deep, like, oh no, I got to eat now sort of feeling that you get. And then just like, because you're sort of incrementally working on not just strength really, but like, for instance, in order to do a good squat, you need to have pretty good mobility and range of motion in your hips to be able to like bend down the right way instead of kind of like lurching over with your lower back, which is what I have been doing my entire life. So you just start to move differently in all of these ways that you are moving in real life, but like you don't really realize like how many times a day you bend down to pick something up or like you lean over to grab something and like suddenly your body is able to support itself in all of these ways that you're like, oh, I was having such a hard time before and I (laughs) didn't even realize and now everything is easier. With me, the big thing that I noticed when I first started, and it was a somewhat similar program, like when I started segueing into, it was like starting strength adjacent basically, was, you know, I've At that point, I had, we had just had our third child. And, you know, it's a lot of picking up and moving kids. You know, when you got young kids, particularly babies, toddlers, there's a lot of like, and kind of awkwardly so. And in fact, the back injury, the big bummer about it had been that I was, like, I couldn't bend down to pick up my daughter or reach into the back of the car. That was the thing I started noticing was this like functional strength, which is a term, you know, that's used in this universe was there for these things. Like, oh, I have to awkwardly bend over. And I also knew like, oh, I have to engage my core now and I have to like stabilize myself in a certain way if I'm going to lean over in this way and not get injured while I like pick up my kid. But that really was like a real night and day thing that started to happen that really feels like a revelation. I'm curious what your sort of mental experience of this is. And Mm -hmm. people should go, you can go and read Starting Strength. You should definitely read Casey's Substack. She's a beast. But there's a million different places you go on the internet some of which are sort of weird, but around just like a starting strength program for basic, you know, compound movements or free weight lifts. Yeah. I mean, actually I could talk about pursuant to the place to go. I'm releasing a program that's like a beginner strength program that's from my perspective. So like that'll be out and available. But my mental experience was, I mean, I had always had these very tense and guilt-oriented and destructive relationships with food and my body and exercise. It was like all about punishment and all about like trying to exercise more and more and more and feeling guilty about what I couldn't do. And then trying to eat less and less and less and feeling guilty about that, which I did eat no matter what. Lifting, by contrast, introduced this idea that this is all a sort of constructive, harmonious cycle that you eat for fuel and for joy. And then you go in the gym and you feel really good and you like can crush your weights and add more weight than you did next time. And you feel very powerful from that. And then you get hungry, you eat some more because you worked out, you're tired and you sleep better. And it's just this like, I I was like, I get it now. These things can all support each other and be enjoyable instead of being Torture, torture, and torture. I had exactly that experience too. Although I wouldn't say that it's like solved. I have more hangups now because I'm on camera, I think, that have really gotten in my head. And I think that's like one of the, oh yeah, it's like really, it really gets in your head to be on camera. As someone who is like, like a cis man with who's moving through the world has never been particularly like related in any way to my physical appearance. And any like, you know, I, I've had the privilege of it not being a, kind of not a big deal one way or the other. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, not notable, I think, in like in either direction, just sort of a neutral fact about me, that being on camera makes you completely insane uh, about it. <laughs> Man. I mean, just unavoidably, like you're constantly looking at your felts and if you if you like gain five pounds, you, you see it on the camera really quickly mm. in a way that can be sort of crazy making. But yes, I had that experience of the sort of, that feeling of the sort of harmonious, like, I'm eating and I'm fueling my body to get stronger. And also for me, the biggest thing was it was the first time I looked forward to working out. Like it's the closest thing I found to basketball. Like basketball is something that I will like prioritize all things ahead of to like get into a pickup game. And I never felt that way about going to the gym. It always was like boring, painful. It felt like counting down minutes. It felt like punishment. It felt like detention. I don't know. Like, and The endorphin release and the feeling of accomplishment of like lifting something heavy was something that I was like, I found myself starting to look forward to workouts and being bummed if I couldn't make them in a way that I had never experienced before. And I think other people might have that experience if they try it, who are people who find the treadmill like, or or other things kind of like 
a taxing chore. Yes. I mean, I have two two sort of thoughts about that, which is that, yeah, I do think sort of structurally the um, lifting really appealed to me because I did cardio for a really long time. I was a runner. I never really liked it. I just did not like the sort of slog of it. Like you're just going for, you know, especially when you're training for a half marathon, nine miles, 10 miles, 13 miles at a time. And it's just a lot to just have to plow through. Other exercise was like high intensity intervals, which I was like, this is painful to be doing. So it's it's too intense. Whereas lifting has this cycle of like, you do a set of not that many reps, five to 15 reps, and then you rest for a minute. You just sit there and then you do another set. And I was like, this is my pace. I'm all about this as a sort of workout situation where I'm not like going really hard continuously. And then the other thing is that the other two first kinds of working out, there's not as much of a progression in those sports is not as central as it is usually in lifting weights. Like lifting weights is, especially when you start, it's like the best way, in my opinion, of going about it is like you add weight every session. It's like a little bit of weight, but it adds up. Like in a couple of months, you might be benching or squatting a hundred pounds just because like, that's how it's not like, it doesn't take any particularly great skill in order to build strength that quickly. It's like most people can do that. And I think that's very rewarding and something like running doesn't have that same sort of really predictable pattern to it. Yeah. I mean, I should say to speak up for the runners, like there are people who just love it more than anything. And like people that I'm close to my Kate has recently gotten into it and like really gotten into it in a way that I think there's a whole universe of people who feel the way about running that I do about lifting, which is that it's like this sort of like transported space. It gives them a kind of like deep sense of sort of spiritual ease. It, it relaxes tension. It, it does all these great things. So I don't want to like in any way disparage running for the runners out there. I just have never felt that way about running. I think there's a lot of people who don't feel that way about running and don't feel that way about like other kinds of gym workout that the strength workout might be for them. And the point about progression to me was really, really huge because, look, I'm 42 now, okay? I'm not getting better at anything in my life physically, except this one thing. <laughs> like, and that's really rewarding. I just played basketball on Monday. Like, I am a way worse basketball player than I was when I was 35. <laughs> like, I am not better at basketball. <laughs> I am declining. Like, I was never very good at all. I am declining you know, fairly precipitously, I want to chalk it up partly to being off for, you know, the whole pandemic or most of it. But I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life. I do more. I can do more pull-ups than I've ever done. I am benching more weight than I've ever done. I am squatting more weight than I've ever done. I am deadlifting more weight than I've ever done. That's great. That's sick. <laughs> sick. I'm physically stronger than I've ever been. I have more muscle mass than I have ever had in my life. And at this age, it's like a little bit, I think, of like why people get older and like golf because it's a game you can get better at at the age of like 50 or 60. And for me, this has been one of the really rewarding things. It's like, it's a thing I can get better at. I can actually see improvement. I can see progression <laughs> week after week at 42, which is not happening with other things in my life physically. Yes, I do think if pe if more people knew this about lifting, more of them would do it. I, I And I think like going back to a lot of people don't think much of being strong. They think it's like a very sort of, base quality to have, but I'm like, you got to forget about that part and just try it because like to see yourself go up and wait over the course of weeks is just going to be so rewarding. And you're going to feel like you feel a difference in your daily life. And just that achievement is like, it's, it's very, it's way lower hanging fruit than most people think it is. There's also something primal about the, like, when you put a big plate on and it's bigger than the last plate that you put on and then you can lift it, but you couldn't before. It is just, again, it's like, it's like when you paint a room, there's something satisfying about painting something because you just know when it's done. You know, a lot of tasks that we have in life, and particularly in the world of like, you know, different kinds of symbol manipulation, whether it's, you know, what's broadly called like knowledge work or white collar work. It's like, things are sort of floating around and kind of like never done and kind of done. There's just something very concrete about the numbers and the reps and like doing them and them being done and the plates getting bigger. That is very simple, but very, very, for me, has been very rewarding. Yes. And I think it's also like 
one of the things I liked about lifting too is like that was rewarding, but then also it taught me to see like we have this concept of failure in lifting when you don't sort of complete your set. Like since a weight turns out to be too heavy, you can only do three reps and maybe you sort of fall on the fourth rep and the bar, the, you're squatting and the bar is caught in the safety arms and you're like, oh boy. But the thing is that lifting teaches you to see that as data. And it's like, okay, I couldn't do that. But now I know sort of where my limit is and I can work backward to work back up to that. It's a neutral sort of situation. Whereas when I was running, it would be like, oh man, I didn't like, just like couldn't run as fast as I wanted to. And I just have to try and run faster next time. And it was very abstract. Whereas lifting, it's a little bit more regimented in a way that I was like, oh, it's okay to just like mess up sometimes, you know? We'll be back after this quick break. There's this whole question around how you get over plateaus when you hit them. And I'm still getting stronger, but, and this is the other thing we should say, right? About like when you start is what people in the world called newbie gains, which is like you go up really fast, really quickly when you start. It's extremely intoxicating, but it does like the curve sort of starts to flatten a bit in the beginning. You don't keep going up at that rate. One big thing I think is just like the intimidation of injury and like free weights versus machines, which feel like a little safer and feel like you're not going to injure yourself. But to me, they take away a lot of the fun of the challenge of form, which ends up being a big part of lifting. Like the same way I think in like yoga or other things, like you really have to focus on the various different things your body is doing. Whereas the machine sort of takes that away from you. You sort of focus much more single-mindedly. What do you say to people about free weights versus machines? Yeah, this is a big component of my, like I'm calling it a couch to barbell program. It's called Lift Off. And this is like a big cornerstone of it, which is to think about this as a skill building process. It's not, it's not even really about trying to lift as much weight as you possibly can. It's about building skills within your body that includes being able to move in a particular way. Machines are more just about like kind of building the size of a muscle, which we've probably already agreed is not what you want if you're afraid of quote unquote becoming bulky from lifting. But learning to use free weights is about building the skills that let you move those weights that translate to your real life in a way that machines are not going to. So I understand the fear, like the weights look very heavy. You know, you see guys in the gym using, you know, six, eight plates on each side of the barbell at a time. No one's asking you to do that though. It's like you start where, it's not even like where you're comfortable. It's like where you're capability is and you build from there. No one's asking you to do anything that is putting you at risk of injury or is like really testing your limits. You're always kind of staying in a Goldilocks zone of challenge. And that's like how you can progress really is by doing like neither too much nor too little. Yeah. And in some ways the learning the form is a big part of the fun of it. Like I didn't really know how to do a squat independent of how much weight you're putting up when you're squatting or deadlifting. Like I didn't know how to deadlift before. It looked super dangerous to me. Like you're going to pull your back out. What are you doing? <laughs> and when you learn how to do the form and you're just focused on the form, you're not trying to like show off to anyone. You're not trying to, you know, all you're trying to do is like do it in a way where you learn how to do it. You don't injure yourself and you're focused on ways that don't injure yourself. It's a fun thing to learn how to do. And then like you get better at it just as a form, like before you're even talking about putting weights on it as a, in the same way that you get better at certain poses in yoga or you, you know, you get better at certain skills in a sport. It's a skill that you get better at. Yes. We have a real kind of almost meritocratic conception of lifting that it's like either you were born a football linebacker and you lift weights or you're everybody else and you don't bother with weights because there's no reason for you to be strong, which like nothing could be less true. Everyone could benefit from like learning to squat or deadlift 135 pounds, you're like, I swear to God, your life would be completely different. It would feel different every single day if you just learned to do this. And I think we could benefit from that information sort of percolating a lot more. So something you write about a lot is just sort of fitness culture and it's idiosyncrasies, it's problematic aspects. <laughs> How would you characterize fitness culture? You know, it's obviously, it's an enormous source of content. It's enormous on various platforms. It was, of course, huge in legacy magazines. You know, now it's big on, you know, there's a million different fitness influencers. 
And like, it all feels like a combination of motivational and also like a con. Like, a, <laughs> like, like it sort of feels both at the same time. Like I look at fitness videos and I'm like, oh yeah, I got to get in there. And then it's like, well, this is, I'm being sold something here. Yes. I sometimes worry that I take it a little bit too seriously, maybe, where I'm like, other people see this as just sort of like, oh, fun, I'm going to try this. And like, oh, I tried it. And like, now I'm going to move on with my life where I'm like, this didn't deliver on the things that I feel like it promised me. But the thing that I don't like about it is I feel like it often is working our guilt about not looking good enough or being small enough, weighing, weighing little enough that we need to always be sort of focused on hemming ourselves in, in those ways. And in ways that are often not only impossible to achieve in the long term, but can long term undermine our ability to feel good in our bodies. It's like to bring this back to muscle. When you diet very aggressively, you will lose body fat as well as muscle. When your diet inevitably doesn't work, you regain only body fat. And by doing that, you chip away at your muscle. You're losing your sort of good metabolism that you would have had when you had your initial amount of muscle. And this cycle is doing long-term damage to you (laughs) that you might not realize because all of the fitness stuff that you hear is all focused on just losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. And I think that's very destructive. I think it's hard for people to turn away from the weight question. You know, like that is in some ways unlocking something huge and deep, I think, in all of us in American culture. I think Again, I think sort of cis straight men probably have it the least bad in the categories of people in terms of the cultural messages they get about this. I think other groups of people, I'm very aware of that, but but it does get to everyone. I mean, I think that the messages about, you know, weight and, you know, perceptions of weight and losing weight, I mean, it's, it is amazing how... It, it's like the cultural air you breathe, like the things that people are doing in every moment to, quote, stay in shape as an activity is so omnipresent. And I think it's also like very omnipresent among certain cohorts and certain spaces at certain times. But finding a way to feel healthy about that thing is the trick to me that I think weightlifting has helped me with. That like, it is good. That That's the sort of nice edge. It's like, it is good to get some physical activity in your life. It is good to have some discipline around that, you know, to do it routinely, to see progress. Like, These are all good things, but then the flip side of that is like guilt and, you know, vanity and also insecurity about how we look. It's very hard to have like a pure experience with food or with exercise or with your body. Some people have it and I'm so jealous of them. (laughs) Do that, but do they really? I think many people are maybe who we think are happy are. Right, yeah. (laughs) They're all liars. Even myself, I feel like I'm in a much better place than I was seven years ago, but I still have my own struggles. It's like, I really don't feel perfect in that regard or like I'm like, have totally achieved Oh no, I'm totally psycho about all of it. But (laughs) I think it's, it's important to not kind of beat, I mean, like you could get down a real therapy path here, but it's like, you do have to live in the world ultimately too. And that's like a difficult thing to fully reject. But that's the thing that I like to come back to like the thing that I've liked about strength training is I like feeling powerful. Like I like feeling that like at an elemental way that is like feeling powerful is a different thing than like feeling thin or feeling like swole (laughs) or like there are Mm -hmm. external aspects, which is like, oh, I like the way that like my traps look in that photo. So I'm going to like post that to Instagram. (laughs) And like, you know, so there's that, there's like, you know, there's a certain amount of vanity. And I think particularly in my line of work that you have to work through how you're being perceived by the world and on camera. But the deeper thing that I like is feeling powerful. Like I like the feeling of strength and strong and like that I feel good and strong in my body as an internal truth has been a very gratifying thing to find, which is distinct, I think, from a lot of the like more external derived reasons that drive fitness culture and the reason that like everyone goes to the, you know, join the gym on January 2nd. Yes. It's like a much better core to sort of build your health world around. And it really does just pay off. It's like every time I go to like pick up a box of cat food and it's like 40 pounds and I could just do it. And I'm like, yes, this is like the moment that I love to stay prepared for in (laughs) order to not feel like, (laughs) yes, (laughs) just trying to keep my cat in cans of cat food. 
But you also, you so what are the things that you write about when you write about fitness culture? There's one piece you had about, like, which I really liked, which is about, like, the unattainability of the, you know, there's a whole, all, there are all these bodies that are presented to us in Hollywood, and particularly, like, bodily transformations that are presented to us, which is, like, a thing now. I mean, I'm very obsessed with Kamel Nanjiani in this way because it's, like, <laughs> one of the most striking bodily transformations, which, mm-hmm. for those that don't know, Kamel Nanjiani is a, very, very funny, very talented comedian who, like, started working out a few years ago. He showed up on a talk show. I remember seeing him on a talk show. He's working about working out, and you can tell he was, like, swole. He'd, like, gotten pretty big. But, like, big in a, like, normal human way. Like, oh, he looked like a comedian who'd really been hitting the gym. And then he went from that to, like, Marvel superhero. He's now in the latest Marvel movie, Yes, totally shredded. Not just not just big and muscular, but like he's his body fat is super low. There's like no body fat. He's like he looks like a car, he like when he takes his shirt off, he looks like a comic, like literally a comic book figure. The only closest thing I could come to it, which is like the image of male physique perfection, is Michael B. Jordan in the Black Panther movie, which like I definitely got out of that movie and like <laughs> before I even got home, like pulled out my phone and looked up like Michael B. Jordan Black Panther workout regimen. And of course there were 15 articles with his trainer about like what he had done to get in that kind of shape for the movie. Because it's like, again, it's like from an aesthetic, a dumb aesthetic vacuous standpoint, like the perfect male physique. It's like unbelievably strong with like 2% body fat. You could see like every line, every ripple, every muscle. But like, what do we do with that? Like, again, I'm talking about male bodies here. And again, this is like, it's like one one hundredth of the cultural insanity is put on men and male bodies. But it's it's been wild to watch this transformation and the conversation, particularly with Kumail, who like is very proud of it. I mean, I, I really felt for Kumail in that moment because he was very proud of what he did. From what I know of strength training and weight and bodybuilding, it's like he would have had to work pretty hard to have done that. He has his own body insecurities, but is also sort of like into the the process. Like he, it seems like he did kind of enjoy it and, and, and likes at least certain aspects of it, but now has a lot of conflict about it because it's it was received so poorly in a kind of surprising way when, you know, Chris Hemsworth has been doing this for, right. this I don't even what? know how long now. And he's <laughs> even bigger and way more shredded. Yeah, it was a transformation. It was like, it was the sort of line crossing of his archetype from like, wisecracking, like yes. the wisecracking programmer on Silicon Valley to the like super shredded kind of alpha. But here we're kind of getting into what we started this conversation yes. with, which is like, why yes. is it not right. allowed for somebody who has, quote unquote, has a brain or like has a personality? Like you, it's only allowed to these people who exist as like abstract, beautiful creatures. Well, and I think that one of the things that has been interesting to me about working out pretty consistently and pretty hard for the last like several years is that it's also given me a sense. It's actually kind of given me a way to think about bodies that I see in the world, celebrities, which is like, oh, that's like, that's the product of two 90 minute sessions a day, six days a week with a professional for six months, counting calories at 1500 calories a day. (laughs) Like I know, like I now understand because I work out pretty hard and like have like a normal body that's like stronger than it used to be. Like I now understand when I see, and I and I think it's true also with, I mean, more with men and like weightlifting, but also with women too, where it's like, I get now at a level I didn't before of like, oh, that's not like a, like, that's not a normal thing. That's not a thing you get from like exercising a little more. That's like on a level of like, crash training that just doesn't exist in the world of human beings. And I can now understand that because like, I work out pretty routinely and I know what like normal progressions look like and what norm- <laughs> and what bodies look like after you work out for a while. Yes, yes. This was another like big mental aspect of it for me was like, I spent my whole life like wanting to look like these celebrities up, well, up most of my adult life. And then I finally got to this point where I was trying strength training. It was kind of like, okay, this is it. Like if I can't do any more than this, like this is my limit in terms of time and attention and resources, like that's going to be it. And that, that sort of just reaching the ceiling sort of was like, oh, they're putting so much more into this, not just because they're like more determined than I am, but like they have personal chefs, they have trainers, they have time to work out that much. And it's like, I don't have that much time. I have a few times a week for like an hour and 
that's that's it. It's not. I well, don't it's have also this it's it's literally time. their jobs, and I mean, this is such an obvious point to make about, but like, it's literally their job. You know, I this is my job talking to you right now, and then I'm going to go make a show tonight. Like, I mean, if my job were just to work out. <laughs> <laughs> and like people paying me a lot of money to work out and like giving me a bunch of resources. Like I, I guess I could probably work out four hours a day or whatever, you know, I mean like, right. I mean, no one works out. Two ninety minute sessions is like the sort of most that anyone's doing, even if you're in the, like I'm Michael B. Jordan and you know, Black Panther, but like that aspect to it, like the time that it takes and what it actually takes to become these sort of like cartoonish figures. But again, it is like, I mean, this is like the most unnovel point in the world, but like it is a psychotic thing about America, which is that, you know, the gap between the normal level of fitness and the normal kinds of bodies that we have as Americans and those that are presented to us as models is like the delta between them is truly ludicrous. I mean, truly, truly, truly ludicrous. Yes. I mean, to go back to the sort of idea of like looking up the Michael B. Jordan workout, quote unquote, I wish trainers would be more honest about this. They'll they'll say something in magazines like, oh, well, if someone wanted to get a body like Michael Jordan's, they could start out by doing like <laughs> three sets of 10 bear crawls and like three sets of planks and like uh, these things that like, no, it's like Michael B. Jordan can uh, probably like bench right. 225 pounds and like he didn't do that. He didn't like walk in and do that. He trained for many months, maybe years to get to that point. It's like people need more information. Yeah. I actually, what I weirdly found satisfying, what I find satisfying about the genre of like trainer talks about their workout regime for X movie and is that it often is pretty honest. Like that one was like, you know, like there were six months before the movie started. He was going twice a day. We've had him on a calorie count. You know, it was six days a week. There was like one day off and like, he was doing road work. He was boxing. He was, it was like, it's, you know, it's like, yeah, it was like, who's going to be in the Olympics, you know? And that's, I actually find the reality of that, like, sort of fascinating. I mean, I think that's great, but they don't, they often don't bring that honesty to women's workouts. It'll be like, oh yeah, like <laughs> Gal Gadot did, uh, she did like three sets of 12 curtsy <laughs> lunges and she did some like little triceps extension. Then <laughs> yeah, she did deadlifts. And then like, it's very like small italic text at the bottom. Kate, Kate always mentions this quote and I'm going to mangle it, but there was a Beyonce quote once. And I think it was her role in dream girls, if I'm not mistaken, in which she looks extremely waifish in that movie where someone like asked her like, well, what was your, it was either that or it was an awards dinner. I forget. It was one of the two where it's like someone asked her like, well, what was your, how did you die? And she's like, I didn't eat anything for a month. <laughs> Which is just like, it was just like weirdly like, and sort of refreshingly honest as opposed to like, well, I cut out the fries or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just this like, I starved myself because that is what yes. achieving that body requires is like literal starvation for a literal sustained period of time. Like that's, that's really the only way to get this thing that like then shows up on screen this way. Yes. Yes. I remember this. It was like very plant-based, maybe <laughs> vegan. Yes. No sugar. And that's a uh, very extreme. Like I, but I think I would read stuff like that at a certain point in my life. And I'd be like, oh, that's what I should do. Like the big question is like, why was I getting all that information from magazines instead of like doctors, you know, like right. a doctor would never have that conversation with you. They would be like, you're um, in the healthy weight range. Like, don't worry about it. And I would be like, no, I'm, you don't understand. I need to look good and I need the tools for that. And like the magazines just sort of like swoop into that gap for everybody. And it's not, it's not safe really. To bring it around to strength training, the thing I like about the way that it changes your paradigm on this is that you really come to view food particularly when you're beginning as like the fuel for increased strength as opposed to like the enemy to avoid <laughs> so that you don't gain weight. It's like, right. Like, and particularly when I started where it's like, where my trainer's like, you should be trying to get this many grams of protein a day if you really want to like get stronger. And then you all of a sudden you have this like affirmative target and like, you know, you can't really get there without like supplements or protein shakes and things like that, which I continue to drink. But like, it just changed my conception a little bit. And I've, I've fallen away from a little bit of that because I've gotten into like bulk and cutting routines, which are like dumb and a little self-destructive and a little like disordered. But that's another story. 
<laughs> but um, like this sharing too much. That's not too. I mean, uh, well, I mean, you have your experience is valid. I think I also had that experience where it was sort of like lifting focused me on like what I needed to eat in order to get stronger, which was a very different way of thinking about food from. I really shouldn't be That's eating right. anything. Anything that I eat is like too much and I need to like do as little as possible. Yes. So it was like having this sort of circumscribed, you need to eat enough was completely changed everything for me. Do you think the world of like internet-based fitness, because it's funny that you say like you discover this on Reddit and like there are more sources than ever for this kind of thing than there ever were before. It's not just like men's health or Self Magazine, or this like narrow range of stuff, um, which used to be 20 years ago where all this came from. Do you think it's better now, basically? Like that there's more variety and there's more places that people can kind of come to interesting and healthier ways of thinking about strength and working out? I think it is very slowly moving in a positive direction, huh. I would say. I don't think it's there. I would have hoped like it would have come farther by now than where it was when I started, which was like a very big democratizing moment, which, you know, when I was in high school, your your only option would have been to go up to a bro in a gym and be like, please teach me everything you know about lifting weights. And he might not even really know anything. He might teach you bad stuff that would ultimately get you injured. You wouldn't know. Now we have like all of YouTube and like Uh, some like really, honestly, really high quality Reddit threads that have much to teach us. I found so many books to read from like, you know, following different people on Instagram. There's like an explosion of information. And I don't think necessarily that's led to like, oh, there's more information that's good and bad. I think there is a lot of bad, but I think the good stuff is relatively easy to find. Most of the fitness people who blew up over the pandemic were people who were promising, like, I think there was even like a pandemic bubble, (laughs) but transformation, like trend. Still the big winners are people who are focused on weight loss. But I do see some of the bigger names, for instance, moving away from before and after weight loss transformation photos, which is very encouraging. That used to be like the bread and butter of this influencer, Kayla Itzinus is, I think, how you say her last name. She has an app called Sweat with Kayla, and she initially got popular from these bikini body guides, and she used to only, almost exclusively post transformation photos. Now she never does. And I'm uh, kind of like, okay, that's an interesting bellwether of the direction we might be going in. That's interesting. I mean, the before and after pictures are also just such a hilarious genre, too, because it's like, you could basically do them like before and after a workout. Yeah, or like morning and evening. And like- yeah, like you could do before before a workout in like bad lighting with like sticking your gut out and then after a workout with like a pump going. And like, it's like, it would look quite different. But it's like, again, I think that working out seriously gives you, to me, has given me a more grounded and realistic set of the parameters of the human body and what how it can and can't change. That I now know that like you can, with consistency, and like a repeated and targeted program, you really can get quite a bit stronger and quite a bit better at things doing in a fairly rapid period of time. That is absolutely true and a tangible promise. You cannot transform your body <laughs> in, in the span of some short period yes. of time. And to the extent you do, it's not going to last. Like the only thing that can last is like sustained iterative investments in your own like strength and functional ability. Right. And also more to the point, two things like I think when you go to the sort of top and bottom of the spectrum in this respect, you realize like this is the realization I had was that the way I feel about myself is not linearly related to how small I am. I've been a very high weight and never felt better about myself. I've been a very low weight and been miserable. And the other thing is that I think I wrote about this in talking about Will Smith's weight loss journey, where he says something very insightful about himself, something along the lines of like, I have incredibly extreme discipline. I can force myself to do anything. I know I could force myself to like lose this weight if I wanted to, but I'm not even done with this process and I'm completely miserable and I'm not actually like getting any happiness out of forcing myself to do this. And I think many people like wish and wish and wish for the discipline to be able to like lose lots of weight or like be really shredded. But I think people who get there, if they're being honest, would tell you 
that that's not where happiness actually comes from or like feeling good about yourself actually comes from. Well, and this is true of people's, when you zoom out to like people's talents, it's like people who are like good at math or good at violin or good at dance. In some cases, that's the product of like, you know, psychotic, overbearing parents who like make them practice. But in a lot of cases, there's a sort of connection between people liking to play violin and liking to dance and liking to do math and then getting good at it because they wanted to do it. And then the more they did it, the better they were. But you don't usually get good at stuff you hate (laughs) because to get good at stuff, you have to do it a lot. And doing it a lot requires like some, you're getting something out of it. Not all the time. There are people who like, whose parents make them do stuff and or, or who sort of train for complex psychological reasons. But by and large, like if you can find something you like doing, that's really the foundational key, I think, for anything, any advice that we're giving here on our first ever fitness podcast, <laughs> which is like, if you're finding a thing that you like to do, that you look forward to doing, that gets your body moving, and you can consistently do that, like that's definitely the thing you should do. Yes, this is one of my top things about strength training is that like I think more people would like it than actually give it a chance. So I'm just like, please give it a chance. Like, just try it. This like just the style of the workouts, the resting and the sort of intensity and the progress might people more people might really connect with it than the number of people who actually do try it. Casey Johnson is a cultural critic, writer, editor. She's a heavyweight lifter who's about to launch couchtobarbell.com. You should check that out. She was the editorial director of health and lifestyle coverage advice, but now she writes She's a Beast on Substack, which I really, truly enjoy. Casey, that was a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Once again, great thanks to Casey Johnson. That was a really fun conversation. Um, it just occurred to me that some people might actually even be listening to this while they, you know, work out, do their thing, particularly during the post-holiday, you know, traditional annual get back in the gym time. If you like that conversation, um, you might be interested in one we did with a guy named Herman Ponser, who's a evolutionary biologist who works on studying how the human metabolism works, which is a really interesting conversation we had a while back. You could always send us feedback. Email withpod at gmail.com. Tweet us the hashtag withpod. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. <laughs>